time. So uh, welcome again for joining this webinar today. Um, I'll go through the quick overview about uh, uh, the agenda. We'll cover look at H2O, uh, H2O of the company. Uh, before prior to that, we'll look at Azure HD Insights platform. Then we'll look at the sparkling water uh, product overview. Um, follow that uh, with the demo, and then some time for Q and A at the end of it. Okay. Uh, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to um, Zhaoyang Zhu, uh, who's our main speaker today. Uh, he's the program manager at Microsoft, uh, and he'll give us a brief overview about the Azure HD Insight platform. Uh, over to you, Xiaoyang. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Xiaoyang Zhu, and uh, I come from Microsoft HD Insight product team. Uh, thank you, Jaoyang. And uh, so myself, I'm Vinod Ayengar. I'm the director of finance and biz dev at uh, H2O. Uh, background in data science and uh, worked in the data science and marketing space for over 10 years. Uh, our uh, the third uh, person on the call is Jorge Hernandez Filippo. Uh, he's a data science intern and uh, worked very closely on getting the uh, H2O platform running on HD Insight. Uh, so Jorge, do you want to give a quick line? Hi everyone. My name is Jorge. Um... I'm a data science intern here at H2O. Uh, we're, I'm part of the um, H2O cloud team that we're working on getting H2O to the cloud, basically. Thank you, Jorge. All right, um, so let's get started. Um, I want to hand it over to Javian to uh, give us an introduction about the Azure HD Insight platform. Um, Javian, take it over. Thanks, thanks, Vinod. Uh, so hi everyone, I will spend a few minutes on uh, what ATD site is and uh, what kind of problems are we solving. Uh, so when can you go to the next slide? Uh, if we zoom out a little bit and uh, you know, take a look at all the data services available on Azure, you will see that Azure tries to solve all the data related problems from end to end. From left, from ingesting data such as from data factory, from event hubs, and to object storage like error blob storage and big data storage such as data lake store and to analytics uh, platforms such as error machine learning data lake analytics and of course HD insight which is a managed Hadoop solution and then to the final virtualization part such as power bi and also intelligence parts such as cognitive services etc next uh, so if we zoom in a little bit to HD Insight, it's very clear that the contribution that you know the open source platforms bring to the advanced analytics is almost the de facto in this area. Many of the enterprises are looking how they can use Hive and Spark and HBase, Kafka, Storm, etc. But the challenge here is that it's not so easy to set up those clusters. It's not easy to monitor those stuff, it's not easy to secure those uh, Hive and Spark workloads. Uh, and at, at the same time, it's not easy when you are working with the high scale volume of data. And that's where HD Insight comes in. So as you can see here, uh, this is like some uh, HD Insight uh, uh, kind of pitch here. But uh, it is the most reliable and open source analytics platform with the industry leading three nines of SLA. And by the SLA, what I mean is it's the only cloud offering that give you a three nine. Uh, not only for the Euro VMs that make up your cluster, but also the three nines for the overall platform, for the overall cluster that we offer. So you get a three nine reliability for the Spark cluster, for Hive cluster, for NoSQL HBase, Storm, Kafka, Microsoft R Server, etc. So it's a really a fully managed cluster service. Uh, and also, it's a, not only it's the best platform to run the regular Hadoop workloads such as Hive, Spark, etc. It's also the best place to run the data science uh, uh, workloads on top of big data. Uh, next. Uh, so yeah, if you think about like running data science applications on top of big data, usually it's a little bit hard to do so because there are a few blockers here. The first one is that the time to insight for big data science for data science team is is long. For example, you might just run your machine learning application in one machine. It takes like 
hours or maybe even days to get the final result. And you might need to go back and forth to choose the right model, to tune the hyperparameters, etc. And that process can even take days or even weeks. And second, uh, let's say you already choose a distributed way, like Hadoop, to, run, to train your model over hundreds of gigabytes of data or even terabytes of data. It's hard to set up those environments. You might need to uh, buy the hardware, you need to set up the Hadoop environment, you need to configure the right parameters for your cluster, you need to you know, monitor the cluster to make sure everything goes well. And those are extremely hard for the data science team. And the, thus the management team, the leadership team, might either set up a separate infrastructure team to handle those stuff and which cost time and money, or uh, the leadership team might just waste the data science team's valuable energy. And finally, even you have set up an environment to run the data science on top of big data, it's still hard for the data science team to cover it with other teams. For example, you might want to quickly train a model and publish the model to be consumed by others, or you might want to work with another data scientist in a particular project through some notebook-like experience. So uh, it's a little bit, bit hard to do those uh, team data science approach, and those problems are challenging, and that's why uh, HD Insight team and the uh, H2O team come together to make H2O available on HD Insight to make the data science life easier. Uh, so this is some brief introduction, and uh, uh, there are more contents for the uh, HD Insight, so we put some links at the end of the deck, so if you are interested in adopting uh, or trying out uh, HD Insight, you can just uh, uh, use this uh, free error trial edit, uh, credits. Uh, so I will hand over to Vinod to show us why and how this collaboration can make uh, can help our uh, data scientists. Perfect. Thank you, Xiaoyang, for the uh, nice introduction to the Azure HD Insight platform. Um, as you can see, it's a very compelling platform for running big data as a service on the cloud. Um, I'll give a quick overview about uh, H2O.ai, the company, and then follow it up by the product uh, H2O platform. Um, so we are a, a venture-backed company founded in 2011-2012, uh, uh, five-year-old company, uh, about 70 employees, um, uh, mainly working out of the Mountain View headquarters. Um, we have a few folks in New York and some folks in Europe as well. Uh, we have four core products, the H2O open source engine, uh, Sparkling Water, uh, which is uh, running H2O on top of Spark, and that's the product we'll focus on today. Um, we have a new product called Deep Water, which is best of deep, deep learning uh, libraries like TensorFlow, MX, and Cafe running inside H2O. And finally, we have a product called Steam, which is our DevOps platform um, to launch secure multi-tenant cloud H2O clusters on-prem. Um, so the H2O team uh, itself is distributed into three groups. Uh, we have distributed systems engineers who are uh, writing machine learning algorithms uh, to run them at scale uh, in a distributed fashion. Uh, we have uh, Kaggle winning data scientists who played a dual role. They play product managers by uh, defining what algos need to be built, what features need to be added to the platform. Uh, they also are primary users of the platform by, because they test it out extensively at our customer locations. And finally, we have a world class visualization team uh, that helps uh, build nice interfaces for uh, the end products of machine learning. Uh, the, this uh, leads to uh, good solutions on machine learning interpretability. Uh, to understand what uh, what the the model does under the hood, uh, this is especially important when you're doing uh, black box models like uh, deep learning and GPL. Um, uh, we are an open source company, so what we really care about is the community growth. Uh, and as you can see, um, it show as over, used at over nine thousand companies globally, and over eight thousand data scientists uh, are using H two on a regular basis. Um, in, in, uh, in terms of Fortune 500 companies, we are over indexed that as well. Um, we have uh, a lot of presence in the Fortune 500, uh, including eight out of the top 10 banks, seven out of the top 10 insurance companies, and four out of the top 10 healthcare companies, all users of H2O. Um, H2O is also recognized in a lot of the key analyst reports. Uh, we are uh, placed in the Gartner Magic Quadrant for data science platforms as a visionary. Uh, as you can see, very close to Microsoft in the same quadrant. Uh, we were also uh, mentioned in the Forrester wave um, as, a, as, a, as a key performer, strong performer. 
And finally, H2O is often frequently included in deep learning reports where we are one of the key players for deep learning. Uh, so as much as the community growth is amazing, uh, we really care about customers um, who are also, uh, who will hold pay the bills for us. Uh, as you can see, we have a lot of uh, household names and verticals across uh, the board, uh, financial services, telecom, insurance, healthcare, and marketing. Uh, a lot of big names, uh, mostly Fortune 500 companies who are all customers of H2O. Um, and these are some of our customers who have gone up on stage at uh, user conferences to give us feedback, uh, give us testimonials, uh, tell us what they are doing with machine learning, uh, talk about what kind of use cases they have been successful with, with H2 and machine learning. Um, and we have folks like Pawan uh, Devakarla uh, from uh, Progressive, um, uh, Connor Jensen from Zurich, uh, our folks from Capital One, Beals and Catalina. Um, then, of course, uh, folks from Kaiser, PayPal, Transamerica, and MarketShare, uh, who have actually presented their use cases at our conferences. Um, I'm, I'm not going to play the videos, but uh, when I share the deck, the links will all be there. So uh, I encourage you to check out the links to uh, learn a little bit more about the use cases in machine learning that uh, these com big companies have been doing. So um, before we get started, what's H2O? Um, if, uh, there may be a few in the audience who probably haven't heard about H2O before, so I'll give a quick overview. Uh, so H2O is three things at once. It is a math platform at its core. Um, so we have implemented, it's an open source in memory machine learning platform uh, for doing parallelized and distributed machine learning. What that means is we have taken the most common statistical learning algorithms like GLM, random forest, GBM, deep learning, et cetera, and implemented them in a parallelized and distributed manner. So uh, that means that uh, the math can scale uh, pretty much linearly as your data size increases. Um, so this is a big difference and significant importance of the platform is the ability to do complex accurate uh, templates math very accurately and in a really performant fashion. Uh, uh, is also a, uh, has a nice robust API. So the platform itself is written in Java, uh, so it's perfect for Java programmers. But we realized that data scientists are not Java users. Uh, they use uh, tools like R and Python. So we created this nice REST API that allows H2O to be driven from R, Python, or H2O flow, which is our web GUI. Uh, and we'll see that in a minute, and, and a little bit later in the, in the webinar. Um, and then, but you can also use it through Excel or Tableau. Um, so that's the real big strength of H2O, is the ability to be used from all these different user interfaces that are extremely uh, easy to use. Uh, and finally, H2O is built for big data. We are a big data platform. We run very well on top of um, all Hadoop distributions and Spark distributions. Um, now the, one of the key tenets of the company when we started was to help companies use all of their data uh, and do modeling without sampling as much as possible. Um, uh, because our belief is that more data plus better models lead to better predictions. So those are kind of the two pronged uh, focus areas of the company. The ability to scale and handle massive amounts of data and build really accurate models uh, together, that will lead to more positive outcomes for enterprises. So the H2O AI platform as a whole, um, these are kind of the salient features. If there's one slide I would like you to take home, uh, is this is uh, definitely one of the key slides. Um, so we are 100% open source. Uh, every product that H2O puts out is on the open source, is open source. Um, so there is no vendor lock-in. You can try it out uh, and uh, you can play with it today, download from the website, or uh, go to one of the cloud platforms like Azure and get started right away. Um, we are built for the big data ecosystem, so we will play very nicely with all the Hadoop distributions and Spark distributions. Uh, we have a very flexible interface, uh, so you can use H2O through R or Python, uh, Scala, or Java, or H2O Flow, which is the web GUI. Um, we, the, the core of the platform is built to handle smart, like uh, scalability and performance. So, uh, we have these really amazing fast algorithms uh, that are built to be uh, run in a scalable fashion. Um, the entire platform is run uh, in memory, uh, and that gives us a lot of the speed. One big important feature about the H2O platform is the rapid model deployment. Every model you build in, H build in H2O uh, can be almost instantly exported as a POJO, which is a plain old Java object, or a MOJO, which is a model object of the MES. Uh, what that means is that you get a Java representation of the model or a binary representation of the model uh, almost instantly as soon as you build the model. Um, so there is no time loss between taking a model and transpiling it or converting it to code that can go to production for the, uh, scoring and inference. 
Um, and that's one of the big strengths of Edge to Platform, is the ability to uh, explore these models instantly. And uh, you can obviously then uh, automate and streamline the scoring service uh, with the REST API, or you can use, put it into any of your real-time streaming environments very easily. Um, the Azure platform um, uh, is now uh, being GPU enabled. What that means is that we are, our algos can now take advantage of the latest hardware um, that's being made available to uh, speed up your machine learning and deep learning uh, modeling uh, requirements. Uh, and finally, Azure is integrated with all the major cloud providers, including uh, Microsoft Azure, uh, Amazon AWS, and Google Cloud. So as I mentioned earlier, there are four core products. Um, the core H2O AI platform, which is an in-memory distributed machine learning platform. Um, this is where all the algos reside. So every algo in H2O comes from the H2O AI platform, and that's sort of imported into the other products as well. The deep water product, which is our next generation uh, deep learning platform uh, that can run on GPUs. Uh, what we've done is we've uh, bought in TensorFlow, MX7, and CAFE inside the H2O. And then uh, Sparking Water, which is our Spark integration. Uh, so H2O running very tightly on top of Spark. Uh, we believe this is the best machine learning on Spark currently in the market. And then finally, Steam is our DevOps product for streamlining and model building. Um, what Steam does today is lets uh, on enterprises start secure on-prem clusters uh, on their Hadoop environments. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, the focus today is gonna be on Sparking Water and we'll dig a little deeper into what the platform actually does. So let's start with the core H2O platform because that's the that's where all the algorithms reside. So this is a quick high-level uh, architecture of the H2O platform. Um, so you can, uh, as you can see on the left, you can ingest data from uh, a variety of different data sources, uh, including Azure Blob Storage and Azure Data Lake. Uh, once the data is ingested, um, you, what you create is an in-memory uh, key-value store, and that's the H2O data frame. Um, and this H2O data frame uh, is uh, built to handle, have lossless col columnar compression. Uh, what that does is it lets you load more data into memory as compared to disk. Um, and that, that gives you a lot of uh, improvements in speed and scalability. Uh, once the data is in memory, um, you can apply one of H2O's uh, different uh, EDA or feature engineering and data munging uh, functions to do a lot of the pre-processing and the data munging on, the, uh, on your data set. Um, and uh, once you've cleaned your data set and munched it, uh, you can then apply one of H2O's uh, supervised and unsupervised learning algorithms um, and then uh, run uh, a lot of the data science tooling uh, work you do typically like uh, running grid searches, hyperparameter tuning, uh, doing cross-fault validation, um, and do all of that and get find the best model possible for your use case. And once you have a model, then you can do one of two things. You can then uh, do in-memory prediction by uh, scoring against H2O uh, which is running, or more typically what customers will do is they, you can export the model as a POJO, which is a plain old Java object, or a MOJO, which is a binary uh, representation of the model, and, and then you can shut down the H2O cluster. You don't need H2O anymore. These model implementations can then run directly on uh, real-time scoring or streaming environments, like uh, Spark, Kafka, Storm, or Hype. Uh, very quickly, uh, look at the different algorithms that are supported in H2O. Um, as you can see, um, uh, we have a wide variety of supervised and unsupervised learning algorithms. Uh, we have all the, cl the classic statistical learning algorithms like the GLM, um, GBM, Random Forest. Um, and, uh, and on the so unsupervised side, we have algos like K-means, uh, Principal Competent Analysis, and GLRM, which is an extension of the PCA that can handle uh, uh, numeric, categorical, Boolean, and missing values very well. Uh, we also have anomaly detection using autoencoders, and then we have a really good multi-layer feed-forward neural network deep learning implementation. The key thing to remember is each of these algos in H2O is fully parallelized and distributed, and they are all fully featured as well. And what that means is that uh, for every algo, we have close to 40 different tuning parameters. Um, so they're, they're very robust and they, have, uh, they can handle a wide variety of use cases and data sets. A quick look at uh, uh, how we do the distribution. Uh, this is, of course, a very complex topic, and uh, we have a lot of uh, videos on, on uh, YouTube and on slide chat, uh, decks where you can, uh, where some of our engineers have described how we do the distribution. Um, so I'll spend a little, just a minute on this, uh, but uh, I'd encourage you to check out the videos to get a deeper understanding of how we do the distribution. Um, so um, H2, uh, uh, H2, what we did is we wrote our kind of in-memory fine-grained map reduce. So 
every algo is implemented in a unique fashion uh, so that uh, uh, we ensure that math is accurate and there's a very accurate representation of the original theory. Uh, so we work very closely with the, our uh, academic uh, advisors. Um, they are professors of Stanford, professors uh, Boyd, Stephen Boyd, um, uh, Rob Tipshirani and uh, Professor Trevor Hasty. Um, they are these are the guys who wrote some of the core algos uh, in the literature around it. And by working closely with them, we made sure that the math is accurate. Um, so uh, this is an example of a GBM uh, where what we do is we uh, distribute the data uh, row-wise uh, uh, into the different nodes, uh, and it sure does the distribution for you. Uh, as a user, you don't have to worry about how to distribute it. Uh, we do the dis in memory distribution, and then we build local histograms at each of those nodes, and then uh, combine that in a global histogram to find the cut points for the trees. So this is just one example of how we do it. Um, but the benefit of the user is that they can um, they they will run just a single R script or Python uh, script uh, without having to understand or know what's happening under the hood. Um, it'll look like a simple model that's being built on your laptop, uh, but all you're doing is you're pointing it to a cluster, and the same model is now built on a massive cluster across many nodes. Uh, and that's the strength of the platform is the ease of use for doing big massive uh, scale machine learning. Now, let's get to sparkling water, which is the kind of part uh, that we're gonna focus on today, and the demo is also gonna be focused on this. So what's sparkling water? Uh, the goal of sparkling water was to bring best of breed machine learning to Spark. Um, so Spark is a great platform. Uh, the, it has really elegant APIs, um, it is multi-tenant, uh, it's extremely fast uh, uh, as compared to traditional map reduce based techniques. So Spark is great for data processing and munging. But um, what uh, a lot of customers realize is that uh, uh, machine learning on Spark is not as good. It doesn't scale well and doesn't have a, a wide coverage of algorithms. And that's where H2O comes in. Um, H2O's core focus is to build really robust machine learning capabilities um, and do that in an in a, in a easy to use fashion. So all H2O algos are very extremely easy to use but they're also fully featured. Um, so we combine uh, Spark and H2O uh, to bring the best of uh, both worlds for uh, users of Spark. Um, so the benefits of using sparkling water are um, you are able to use H2O algorithms in conjunction with uh, Spark and MLLib algos. Uh, so you could uh, uh, potentially have a pipeline where you do some work in Spark MLLib, then call an H2O algo and go back and forth very easily. Um, you can also build ensembles of uh, uh, ensemble models using H2O and MLLib algorithms as candidate models under the hood. Um, and then, of course, you can use uh, MLLib algos inside H2O as well. Uh, like, for example, we have the ability to use uh, a support vector machine uh, from H2O flow, um, just like you would do any other H2O algorithm. And finally, uh, we have the ability to export all of the MLLib models that we have ported over as POJOs as well for uh, inference and scoring. A uh, quick look at the architecture for the sparkling water product. Um, so uh, if, uh, if you folks are aware of Spark, the way it works is uh, there is a driver node uh, where Spark context resides. And this is where uh, all of the uh, work is being assigned to the individual nodes, worker nodes. So Spark executors are running on each of the worker nodes and Spark context drives the work. So what we do in uh, sparkling water is we run the H2O context in the same driver node as the Spark context. So the H2O context and Spark context are running uh, the same node, and the H2 executors are running inside the same JVM as the Spark executors. So what that means is that uh, the memory mapping, uh, memory, uh, H2 and the, uh, H2 data frame and Spark RDD or data frame share the same memory space. So the data transfer between H2 and Spark is, uh, is extremely cheap and efficient. Uh, so you can write a pipeline where you go back and forth between Spark and H2O data frames, uh, and that op those operations are extremely fast. Um, and the benefits of uh, Spark Water all accrue to the customer. So um, H2O uh, gives you a nice R, Python, and Flow uh, interface, and those are all available now to Spark users as well. So just to kind of highlight how it works in practice is uh, once you have a data source, um, typically you can do, do it both ways. So uh, if you're running a Spark cluster, you can import data into Spark and create the Spark data frame. And uh, the H2O, in H2O context, you can use H2O context to transfer the Spark data frame into an H2O data frame. In just one single command, as you can see, you do as data frame H2O context. Um, and the same thing you can do on the other way too. So once 
if you import a data set into H2O first, you can then transfer it, convert it into a Spark data frame very easily, use as Spark context. And um, very similar command transfers the data set, data frame into Spark versus H2O. So what, what, why would you use sparkling water? What are the use cases? Uh, what kind of pipelines would people build? So one example is doing model building with sparkling water. So if you have a data source, you ingest the data uh, into uh, a Spark data frame. Then you do data munging with Spark. Um, you can use Spark SQL for some other work, or you can use PySpark for doing the transformations. Once you do that, you can use H2O for running modeling. You can call one of H2O's algorithms to do the modeling. And then you can use a, a pipeline, the sparkling water pipeline, which has both Spark uh, function, Spark transformations and H2O modeling into a, a single pipeline for prediction processing. Um, now the data munging piece itself uh, could uh, use both H2O and Spark. Uh, so H2O has really uh, good data munging capabilities as well. Um, and there are a lot of functions in H2O that are uh, useful for transformations and they're extremely fast. So you might want to use H2O's data munging in conjunction with Spark's data munging to write a pipeline where you do data load, munge, and exploration. And then you can then eventually call H2O or Spark for modeling itself. And finally, um, for stream processing. Uh, so if you say you do some data munging and modeling in a Spark uh, plus H2O pipeline, you can export the whole code in a, in a binary format uh, and deploy it in a, in a stream processing environment where you can have data coming in from Spark Streaming, Storm, or Flink, and use the entire pipeline to do the, the processing. So uh, finally, to wrap it up, um, uh, what does uh, Sparkling Water 2.0, which we released late last year, uh, brings the, uh, adds more visual intelligence capabilities, so you have more ways to visualize the work you're doing in uh, Spark uh, plus Spark, uh, Sparkling Water using our H2O Flow uh, web GUI. Uh, we also have Zeppelin notebook support now for Sparkling Water, and then uh, the ability to integrate uh, Spark algorithms in the in Flow. Uh, and finally, you can also write Scala code directly in the browser now. Uh, so, um, if you write an H2O pipeline, you can have some Spark uh, Scala code in the notebook, as, as shown over here. Okay. So now let's talk about quickly talk about H2O and Azure HD Insight. So um, the motivation, as uh, uh, Yang mentioned earlier, was to bring in uh, the best of breed machine learning uh, to uh, the HD Insight platform, which is uh, uh, becoming uh, one of the best platforms for doing big data on the cloud. Um, so HD Insight, as uh, Zhaoyang mentioned, has mentioned, has Hive, Spark, Kafka, Storm, uh, and HBase all built in. Um, and by bringing H2O plus Sparkling Water there, we are bringing the ability to run uh, deep learning, GVM, GLM, and all these algos that H2O provides very easily. So how do we get started? Um, uh, basically, uh, well, at this point, I think we can jump to a demo before I come to this. Okay. So this is the Microsoft Azure interface for uh, folks who uh, who have seen this before. If not, you can go to portal.azure.com and sign up for a new account and talk about uh, some free credits, how to get started. Um, so once you are here, what you can do is you can then search for H2O in the marketplace and see this offering, H2O Artificial Intelligence for HD Inside Beta. Uh, this is the, the product that we're gonna pick today and work up with it. So you pick this one. Um, there's some information about what the, uh, what the product does. Uh, and then go ahead and hit Create. Um, at this point, you have the option to uh, configure the cluster. Um, so you can uh, enter the cluster name. I'm going to call it H2O uh, Webinar Demo. Um, you can pick a subscription type. You can pick the cluster type here. Um, just one thing to remember is uh, uh, the Sparkling Water Edition only works, uh, H2O HD Inside Edition only works on Spark 2.0 at this point of time. So we pick that out for you by default. Um, going forward, we'll have other versions like Spark 2.1 and more when they come out. Uh, at this point, you only have 2.0 support. Um, so you can uh, enter a cluster uh, uh, login name. Uh, by default, it's admin, but you can change it if you want. I'm going to leave it as it is, and I'm going to um, enter a, a nice, secure password. Oops. Uh, 
And I'm going to use the same uh, password for my SSH login as well. Then go ahead and use, uh, I already have an existing resource group. Um, resource group is basically a collection of resources. So it could be the storage, the, the passwords, and all the security things. Uh, we already have one in this place, so we're just going to use it. If not, you can always create it separately. Uh, so the location right now is used US by default, so we'll leave it as it is. I'm going to select this, I'll come back. Um, but you can always pick a different location depending on where your geography is. Uh, we'll give you a better performance. So this is where you get the option to pick your storage type. Uh, we're going to pick Azure Storage, uh, but you can use Data Lake Store as well. Um, H2O uh, has integrations for both the Azure Storage, Blob Storage, and the Data Lake Storage. Um, so wherever your data resides, we can ingest data from there. So I'm going to leave it at Azure Storage for the default. Uh, I'm going to just uh, use our existing Blob account, but you can create a new account if you wish. Very easily by hitting Create. Uh, for storage and data lake, I'm going to leave everything as it is. I'm not going to I'm use, going to use the default options. Okay. So at this point, uh, you have to, you can select the H2 option, and uh, you have to review the legal terms, uh, which is all pretty straightforward. Uh, you're open source, uh, but uh, you can go through the legal terms, and then you hit, hit purchase. Uh, keep in mind, there is no pricing, additional pricing for H2 offering. Uh, even though it says purchase, uh, all you're doing is you're purchasing the HD inside uh, of platform's uh, uh, usage. Uh, you're not paying anything extra for H2 at this point of time. So hit OK, purchase, and then hit OK. And go next. Now at this point, you have uh, all the information. You have, it tells you how many. Uh, so I have a seven node cluster, two head nodes, two or four worker nodes, and one edge node total of 44 cores, and all the information is available. I can hit create, and it will uh, launch a new cluster. Um, though this typically takes anywhere between 20 to 30 minutes um, to launch a cluster, uh, so bear that in mind. Um, but in the interest of time, I'm going to jump to a cluster we already have up and running over here. So we created a cluster just before um, uh, the webinar for, as a cookbook style. Uh, so once you create the cluster, you'll see uh, all this information. It'll give you a cluster dashboard. It'll give you uh, ability to scale the cluster as well. It tells you the information about the head worker and edge nodes. It tells you all the cores and some nice information. Uh, you can set up some access control and other tools over here um, in this interface. Uh, if you want to do a secure um, uh, SSH login, you can hit this, and then you can log into the shell uh, through secure SSH. So uh, this is the URL that's created. Now if you go, um, so at this point, if you click on the URL, it'll lead you to the Ambari dashboard and gives you some usage about the Hadoop cluster. Uh, so as you can see, there's not much uh, minimal disk usage, some network usage. Uh, we are not using much of Yarn right now because there, is no job, there are no jobs running. Um, but uh, if you go ahead and then uh, hit Azure, the same uh, login slash Jupyter, it will go to the Jupyter Notebook IPython interface, Jupyter Hub. And you can look at all the notebooks that are available. Uh, by default, we'll go to the screen where we have this notebook called Quick Start. The Quick Start notebook is great if you want to run jobs separately, but I'm going to do a demo directly today. So we'll go to the sentiment analysis with Sparkling Water demo. That's the demo we'll look at. So um, this is a really uh, quick, uh, uh, simple demo using Spark plus H2O, and it kind of demonstrates all the, uh, the capabilities of both platforms. Um, so one thing to remember is the cell, when you start the notebook, this is the first cell you see, um, and this is the quick start, uh, and you have the ability to change the size of the sparkling water uh, executors. So you can specify how, many, how much memory you want to assign to sparkling water job, uh, how, many executor, how much executor memory, and how many executors. Um, and this will, uh, this is all defined over here. You can change it, and that will basically uh, do the configuration. Um, you need to run the cell first to basically distribute the sparkling water jar. Um, and this is a this, uh, and once this is done, then you can go ahead and uh, import PySpark and uh, sparkling water in H2O. And at this point, it will start the H2O uh, sparkling water cluster. 
Um, the key thing to remember is uh, uh, currently in the current iteration, every notebook, Jupyter notebook, is treated as a separate sparkling water job. So if you were to run, if I were to run this notebook, this will uh, Jan will allocate all this memory to this sparkling water job, and if I were to open a new Spark uh, notebook, that would require its own separate memory. Uh, so uh, what I would recommend is uh, if you launch a uh, decent enough cluster, uh, find, uh, find out how much memory you want to use. Typically we recommend based on the data set size, uh, about 3 to 4x the amount of memory for running that, uh, running on the, working on the data set. So uh, assign the right amount of memory and once you're done, you can shut down, you can fully close this job by going to the Jupyter Hub and basically uh, selecting it and hitting shutdown. So you can close that, uh, uh, stop that kernel and then start a new one for a new job. Okay, so let's go ahead and um, get started. I'm gonna hit this. So this will run. And uh, so it basically distributed the sparkling water jar. Um, it did the, all the configuration, it's all set up. Now we'll go ahead and hit this. Um, and this will basically start the uh, sparkling water shell. Um, so what this is running is, is basically uh, distributing the sparkling water jar and starting up the H2O context as well. Uh, it'll take a couple of minutes and once that's done, we can then go to this URL which will basically open the H2O flow interface and uh, we can actually look at what's happening over there. Um, so while this is happening, okay, that took a minute. Uh, while this is happening, I'm gonna walk you through the data uh, set and a little bit of the information about what this use case is all about. Uh, so this is a Kaggle data set where they had a bunch of uh, uh, review restaurant reviews. Um, so as you can see, we are uh, gonna import the data set uh, from Azure Blob Storage. Um, and we have been import the data set. Uh, and it's, it is a nice use case because it has some text information. Uh, the reviews are in text format, and we can use Spark's uh, TF-IDF to convert them into uh, tokens and vectors, and then use H2O's uh, models to actually perform classification. Okay. So in this case, uh, we, what we're doing is we are actually using uh, H2O to ingest data, bringing the, uh, and selecting out some of the columns. So we are actually only picking, there's a lot of columns in the data set, but we are gonna pick only a few of these uh, for our use case. Okay, uh, while I'm doing that, the cluster came up. So as you can see, the H2O cluster is up and running. Uh, if I hit this link now, okay, I'm gonna have to go. Oops. I put the wrong password in. Okay, I'll, let me pull up the right password. I think I saved it over here. Uh, second. You might want to open your window in. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. So I'm going to do. Yeah, so a lot of clear the cache. I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do really quickly is, go to Firefox for this. So this is a flow interface, uh, and we'll come back. Are you able to see the flow interface? Yes, okay. So I'll um, come back to that in a second after we run the model. Okay. So, um, so as I was describing earlier, uh, what we're doing is we are ingesting the data, and uh, let me run this whole notebook. Okay. 
and let this let, let this whole thing run. And while it is running, I can walk you through what's happening. So as I said, we are ingesting the data first, and then uh, we then start uh, we upload the data set into the into the H2O context. Uh, we are removing some of the columns. We just pick a selected number of columns for this data set uh, that for this use case. And uh, this is, uh, so this is the first step we're gonna do so is some munging with H2O. So uh, what we are gonna do over here, uh, what you're gonna do over here is basically uh, convert the, uh, the time zone column into a bunch of variables uh, to be created uh, the day, month, year, day of the week, and hour variable from that same uh, column. So we take that one column, uh, which is a time uh, in the ETC, UTC format, and we convert it into five different columns. Uh, so this is very easy to do with H2O, as you can see. Um, and once you've done that, we will then basically uh, convert this uh, data frame into a Spark data frame. And uh, we'll do some munching with Spark. So we take this data frame, we convert it into Spark data frame. As you can see, you have some columns over here. You have the time, you have the summary, uh, the helpfulness, uh, where, uh, numerator and denominator, this is basically the review number. Uh, so if someone gave um, uh, three or uh, four, what, whatever review they gave, that's the number over here. And these, these are the columns we created in H2O, as you can see the day, month, year, day of the week, and hour. This all were created from this one column. Um, once we do that, um, then uh, we're gonna try and create a couple of uh, additional columns. Uh, what we do is uh, we're gonna create the average score uh, by year and add that as an additional column. So um, this is also just to explore the data set and get a feel of what's happening. So we, we did the simple uh, query over here to do an average um, um, uh, score by year. And this is all running in PySpark. Uh, we did that and then we can, uh, we can then look at the tables itself. It shows all the tables that were created and we publish this table as a hive table in this case. Uh, once it's done, we can then look at, uh, we can plot that data set because now it's available in, in the PySpark context. We can use matplotlib to plot it and we plot it to see uh, the average reviews, number of reviews by year. And as you can see, um, uh, it's uh, heavily weighted towards recency. So 2012 is where the most reviews were. Um, at this point, what you're gonna do is we are gonna then convert uh, this data set, uh, at least the reviews column, uh, using TFIDF and Spark into vectors. Uh, because H2 can then run uh, one of our and one of the models on the vectors to actually use it for classification. So in this case, what we did is before we do that, we also converted the binary score into uh, positive or negative. So instead of using one to five as the rating, we uh, we picked anything less than three as negative uh, and uh, greater than three as positive. But um, that having said, we then. Um, we are going to look at the data set and then we'll, here's where we'll do the uh, TFIDF. So what we do is first do that use the tokenizer uh, to convert the, the column uh, summary into tokens and then use uh, a clear IDF to create uh, uh, an IDF feature, which is an inverse document frequency and uh, TF feature. So we have two additional uh, columns that have been added. Um, and then we, once we have those columns added, we then convert the data frame back into an H2O frame uh, and then we can see we have all these features added. So we have the IDF features as well. And this is basically a vector representation of the summary. And now we don't need the summary anymore, so we removed it. And at this point, we then uh, do some factorization. So you convert some of those variables into factors uh, from uh, numeric and uh, run the model. Um, so in the, for the H2O model, we, what we did is we are gonna run a deep learning model. Uh, and we're gonna try a grid search. We're gonna have a different bunch of different combinations for uh, hidden layers, we're gonna, and then uh, some combinations of epochs. So we're gonna try a two and 10 and two and two. And we also define some stopping criteria so that uh, uh, once we have a good enough model, we don't have to run all the way. And these are benefits of H2O, uh, where uh, you have stopping criteria, grid search, hyperparameter tuning, cost flow validation, all built out of the box. Uh, and then we just basically define the grid and let the grid run. And it uh, is now continuing to build the model. So as you can see, the model is being built. Uh, while this is happening, uh, I'm gonna go to the uh, H2O flow interface and uh, quickly show an overview. So most, a lot of people might have seen this flow interface, but it's a really nice uh, uh, web uh, GUI, interactive notebook style interface to do uh, modeling. Uh, so you can technically uh, import the data, uh, build models, uh, split the frame, um, and do all of your predictions as well, all on the same data frame. Uh, it's extremely easy to use. Um, so while we're doing this, I'm gonna go and do list all models. 
And this is showing me as the models are getting built in the Python notebook, we can actually see the models being shown over here and we can inspect them. Um, you can also look at all the frames that have been created. So in this case, as you can see, we created the original the upload, the data set. Then we had, we created us these smaller data frames and we created train and validation as well. So all the frames are available and you can click on any of these to actually look at the data set. So in this case, we can actually see what the, uh, what the columns are, what the features are, and you can even view the data. It'll show some of the, uh, the, the a small sample of the data set and you can actually see what variables we are wearing. Um, so this is nice. Um, so let's go ahead and look at the models one more time. Um, So the good models are built. Okay, look, it looks, it looks like the models are built. I'm gonna go back to the Python interface and see. Uh, okay, so it built the models and it showed us a variable importance. So uh, we built, so what we did now is we built an entire uh, model uh, pipeline where we took a, a data set with text. We used um, uh, H2O's munging to create some features. We used Spark's munging to create some vectors out of the text columns. And then we finally built the model uh, deep learning uh, or a set of deep learning models with H2O and uh, tried to evaluate which model was the best. And we found that uh, this model uh, with an accuracy uh, with the, uh, RMSC and an accuracy of 74.7% turned out to be the best model for this performance. Um, and uh, I'm gonna show the same model and try to look at this over here so you can look, actually look at the models. Uh, you can see the grid search evaluation as it's happening. Um, So this model obviously wasn't very great, but uh, uh, in this model, as you can see, this is the final model which was pretty the best. So the grid one uh, turned out to be the best model. And uh, you can look at all the metrics of variable importance. You can look at the gain in lift charts and some nice visualizations that uh, flow gives you. And uh, one thing, uh, you can actually look at the output of the, uh, what was the actual model that was picked. You can look at the, the hidden layers and the, the weights and the, and the biases, all of those things as well. And finally, you can do a preview POJO. So you, the deep learning model that you picked finally, you can actually get the Java implementation of the model. This is all the weights uh, of the, all the hidden layers over here. So you can actually take this model and this Java code is ready for production deployment. Uh, and that's again, one of the, as I mentioned, one of the mixed strengths of H2O platform. Um, so that covers everything. Uh, so so what next from here? Um, so if you want to get started, I would, uh, there are a few links on this uh, uh, slide. I'll send it out to you uh, later um, and you can check it out. You can uh, click the first link to get started, find the H2 offering on the Azure Marketplace. Um, there's a documentation site which has a lot of information. Um, you can also sign up for, if you don't have an Azure account, I recommend that you can sign up using this link and get a free trial of $200 to try out the platform. Um, and uh, that, that's sufficient to actually run a few uh, clusters and run it for a few hours actually. Um, there is also an H2O HD Insight uh, link which uh, describes how to do the whole process that I just described, I showed you. You can do that whole thing over there. Um, uh, to learn more about sparkling water, um, there is a documentation link and we also have a booklet which uh, describes the whole, uh, you are a whole platform in detail. Um, and then uh, finally, there is a, a blog post uh, that Jav Young wrote uh, on using H2 and HD inside and he walks through your use case as well. Um, so that's also up there. Um, and then uh, finally, I want to uh, mention that uh, we will have a follow-up webinar uh, in a couple of weeks in the middle of the month where uh, Jorge is going to do an end-to-end -end pipeline where he'll uh, take the, the data set, do the munging, and then once it's done, he'll deploy the model into, into a scoring service as well. So um, we'll do the, all of this, all of this, all as well. So um, at this point, I'm going to um, open it up to questions, and uh, Jorge is on the line as well. Uh, he can take some of these questions as well. Um, awesome. Thanks, Vinod and Jaya for the great presentation. Um, we do have a few questions that we're seeing in the chat window, and we'll try to get them. We have about five minutes left on the webinar. Um, okay, so here's a question. Uh, so what's the value prop for data scientists and enterprises, and uh, why should they care about H2O and HD Insight? So between Vinod and Jaya, maybe talk to Jaya. Yeah, Jaya, do you yeah. take this? 
Yeah, so, uh, yeah, just uh, as I said in the, uh, in the, I think, third or fourth slide. So basically, uh, what we are trying to do is to help data scientists to solve the infrastructure problem here. So the data scientists don't need to care about the infrastructure. They just come and uh, provision cluster and uh, run their workloads. Uh, that's one of the value proposition because it's on the cloud. Uh, so it's so easy to set up. That's point one. And the second point is that we do see many use cases where customer uh, want to use the cloud uh, as the model training uh, platform. So they come and use X inside, X inside, H2O to train their models. And after they have the model, they will use the Podo models and uh, copy them to their local, uh, to their on-prem environment so they can serve the model offline uh, for their apps, for their websites, et cetera. So those are the uh, main value propositions for the H2O HD inside. Awesome, thank you, uh, Zhao Yang. Another question is, um, what's on your roadmap and what's coming next? I think maybe Vinod. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, next up, we are, you know, we are working to get um, the support for Sparking Water, Spark 2.1, uh, Spark 2.1, the next edition of that. Um, that's coming out soon. Uh, we are also uh, trying to uh, make the whole notebook experience a little more simpler and cleaner um, instead of, uh, uh, and for that, we have some options by using Azure templates. Um, so those are all sort of immediate next items. Uh, on the overall Azure side, uh, H2O running on Azure, we have a few new, a couple of announcements that are coming up. So um, H2O is now available on Linux DSVM on, on the Azure platform. Um, that's basically the free uh, DSVM that uh, Microsoft Azure has put out. It has all the common uh, open source libraries and uh, tools you need for our data science. Um, and H2O is now available out of the box in that DSVM. Um, we are also working on bringing uh, deep water support to, uh, to Azure, so you can actually run uh, the deep water um, uh, Docker image or the jar file uh, in an Azure uh, template. So uh, that's coming out soon, and that will take advantage of the new NCVs uh, uh, GPU instances that are available on Azure. Um, so th those are kind of the immediate uh, roadmap items um, that are we are working on. Great, thanks, Manu. Uh, so another question is, is there a plan for a deep water event slash webinar in the future? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, once we have the deep water, I think end of the month, we'll probably try to, we'll have a new version of deep water, uh, which will have um, uh, a lot of the algos and more additional examples and use cases built in. Uh, we'll definitely do a webinar uh, around the same time to showcase how to use it. Awesome, thanks for that. Let, let's give us one second to filter through the questions. There's just a bunch. Um, sure. So there's a question about a system also support image processing data models. Uh, so um, at this point for image processing, uh, we, uh, yes, you can use the deep water uh, product to do image processing. Um, uh, it, again, it, and it, it, the performance really comes in only when you run it on GPU instances. So uh, sparkling water doesn't support uh, image processing. You can use Spark for converting images to vectors. Uh, but then, uh, really, what we want to use is the deep water product for image processing. Uh, okay. Yeah, I also see a question asking about the uh, ADF. Oh. Go for it, Javier. Uh, yeah, so I do see a question regarding the uh, ADF integration. So ADF is basically either data factory, which is a you know, pipeline orchestration uh, thing. So uh, currently, we don't have a plan to support ADF regarding the H2O integration, but you can do, uh, uh, what's it called, the custom activities from uh, ADF that can schedule uh, H2O jobs kind of thing. So yeah, so that's basically for, uh, how to serve the model or train the model in some like scheduled matter, yeah. Um, I, I, will, I will jump in at this question. Um, this is basically going to be covered in the next webinar we're going to make. Uh, but to make to give you the guess of it, um, basically you're going to have um, a complete Azure infrastructure that you have your data factory uh, that will connect to uh, some event um, Azure service such as um, event hubs or 
or um, this Azure Stream Analytics, uh, and then you can actually submit um, um, jobs to the ACI cluster. Um, I can I I can give you uh, the documentation on how to submit jobs uh, to HCI. I see. Yeah, okay. Maybe you can publish some blog post or something around that uh, when it's uh, available. Yes. Yeah. Um, we have a question on whether the 21 gigs of RAM is split in three executors. Uh, Hori, do you want to take that? Yes. Uh, so there was a question um, regarding the notebook that we see in the very first uh, cell. Uh, we see that there is a 21 gig um, a memory allocated to executors. Now the question was, is that 21 gig split between the three executors? And the answer is no. Uh, the 21 gigs are allocated for each executor, so the total um, Spark job will have 21 gigs times times three or times the number of executors, basically. Um, there was another question related to that 21 gig. Uh, Pablo asked, uh, the VM size that we use was D4, so it has a 28 gig of RAM, so why wouldn't you, wouldn't we use the 28 gig and why we use 21 gig? And the answer is um, we need to leave some memory um, for JARN and Spark engines to work, basically. Great. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining our webinar today. I apologize for the audio. Um, difficulties earlier, but hopefully that will be fixed for our next one. Uh, check out our next webinar with Jorge in the next few weeks, and I'll go ahead and send the slides and um, recording in about 28, oh, sorry, 24 to 48 hours. Thanks again, everybody. Have a good day. Thank you. Thanks.